Well, the saying goes is that uh, nature abhors a vacuum. And kind of the meaning of that is, is that a vacuum goes against everything of nature and of physics. But I want to kind of change that a little bit this morning, um, kind of reword it to the point that Satan loves a vacuum. Because when there is a vacuum, he will do anything and everything he can to fill it with the things of his own desire rather than the things of God's desire in our lives. Uh, whenever we don't have a real direction, whenever we're kind of wandering around without a real purpose in, in our life, we're not purposefully seeking the Lord's direction, you can be guaranteed that that father of lies is going to fill your mind and fill your heart with the things that he desires and not the things that God desires for us. And that's true as a believer it's definitely true in the non-believer when, again, their hearts aren't filled with Christ. Uh, again, the, the devil himself is going to fill them with anything and everything that he can to make them feel good, to make them feel satisfied as best he can, again, because their lives are not trusting and hoping in Christ. As we get into 1 Kings this morning, we did the intro to 1 Kings as we went through kind of first and second Solomon, uh, first and second Kings uh, last week. As we get into first Kings this morning, we're going to see that there is a vacuum actually in the leadership of the nation of Israel. David had been king now as we enter into the first chapter of first Kings. He had been king of Israel now for about 40 years. Uh, during his reign in Israel, there had been great victories over all of their enemies. The nation was now at peace. The nation had prospered greatly. Uh, and, and, and now his reign was coming to an end. And for the nation, there was a, a time of crisis. There was a, uh, a time of an unknown of, of what's going to happen next at this point in time. And we find out very quickly that uh, Adonijah, David's uh, oldest remaining son, or the, uh, yeah, the oldest of the remaining sons, is now much more than willing to fill that void. Ah, uh, but God. But God. As I shared with you last week in the introduction, David uh, had uh, actually several wives. Uh, that's where Solomon got the idea. He didn't have nearly as many as Solomon did, but he had many wives, and with that he had many sons. We uh, talked last week about how the three older sons were actually now out of the picture. His first son, Amnon, remember he, uh, in his lust and his passion, he had deceived and tricked his half-sister, uh, violated her, and in her shame, her full brother, Absalom, found out about it. Absalom then killed Amnon, the oldest brother. Uh, the second uh, brother, a uh, young man or a child named Daniel or Caleb, uh, depending upon what version you have, for him, he died most likely in childhood. We don't hear anything of him other than his birth. The thirdborn son is Absalom. Uh, and again, uh, Absalom, the, he, we looked last week, he was actually killed by David's commander-in-chief when Absalom himself rose up in a revolt against his own father to take the kingdom from his father while his father was still alive and still strong. And yet that's what Absalom, and he lost his life as Joab, the commander of David's army, killed him. So the logical, the natural, the, the next in line of David's heirs is a young man by the name of Adonijah. Now, uh, Warren Wearsby, a uh, Bible commentator that I enjoy, a lot of to, to read a lot, he says that uh, as far as Adonijah, he felt he deserved the throne. After all, his father was a sick man who would soon die, and it was important that there be a king on the throne of Israel. And like his older brother Absalom, Adonijah seized the opportunity when David wasn't at his best and was bedfast. However, Adonijah underestimated the stamina and the wisdom of the old warrior and ultimately paid for his pride with his life. Those are the words of Warren Wearsby. But 1 Kings doesn't start out with Adonijah, that self 
focused sun, and it actually begins with the events that surround a beautiful young maiden by the name of Abishag. Uh, a beautiful maiden with a terrible name, Abishag. Uh, <laughs> if you, parents, if you have any more children, do not name your daughter Abishag, okay? It rhymes too much with hag, and you know, it, it's just not a good name. But if you got your Bibles with you this morning, turn to 1 Kings, the book of 1 Kings chapter 1. We're going to go through a lot of scripture today, but uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, pull the point together of what I feel God has to say to us today. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 1, now King David was old. Uh, <laughs> he kind of highlights this, not only was he old, he was advanced in years, okay? Uh, they put covers on him, but he could not get warm. Now, this next section, guys, do not try this at home, okay? <laughs> this, is, this, this is something from millennia ago. Verse 2, therefore his servant said to him, let a young woman, a virgin, be sought for our Lord the king, and let her stand before the king, and let her care for him, and let her lie in your bosom, that our Lord the king may be warm. Verse 3, so they sought for a lovely young woman throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag the Shunammite and brought her to the king. And the young woman was very lovely. And she cared for the king and served him, but the king did not know her. And again, that's a, a biblical uh, idiom of they did not have physical relations together. We're going to find out a little bit later, actually, in chapter 2, that this situation with Amishag isn't just something that they thought, well, just by casual information, we're just going to kind of throw this in here. She actually plays a major part in the downfall of Adonijah in chapter 2, but more on that when we get to chapter 2. You can read it during this week, uh, not now, uh, do it later after the service sometime. What we do find here in these first four verses is a situation where David, the the, the, the shepherd king, the, the mighty man of war, a man who had shown himself, at least at times uh, in his previous uh, earlier life, uh, a, a man that was driven by his passions, even driven by lust. Uh, and now he's bedridden, he's physically feeble and most likely impotent at this point. And yet we also find that although he's failing in his physical health, his mind is still sharp. He's definitely not senile at this point in time. As his age, as his feeble physical condition kind of take uh, its toll on him, his circulation uh, as such, it's, it's impossible for him to keep warm. And his servants come up with a plan that uh, literally for you and I, uh, in our time frame, in our culture, it seems pretty strange, okay? But for the times and the condition of three millennia ago, it made pretty good sense. Find a young maiden to be with him, keep him warm. And the word tells us clearly that uh, due to David's uh, failing physical condition, there was nothing sexual here at all. It's, it's very much the same idea of dealing with hypothermia. Uh, you know, when, when the body gets too cold, being out in the wilderness or out in the snow, and just suddenly you start suffering from hypothermia. One of the quickest ways to help deal with hypothermia is to get someone else uh, and again, get them together, like in a sleeping bag together, and that one warm body transfers its warmth over to the cold. So that's kind of what's going on. It's part of Abishag's responsibility. She was probably put in the role at this point as one of his concubines, but again, the word makes it very clear they did not have intimate relations together. Uh, another part about uh, Abishag. Some believe uh, that there is a strong uh, possibility that Abishag the Shunammite might be the Shulamite woman of the Song of Solomon. And we'll look at that a little bit more when we get into chapter 2. So again, you ought to read ahead, but again, not now, okay? Now, with, with, with that little bit of information about uh, Abishag and David, suddenly the writer changes the scene completely, uh, leaves David's situation here, and moves on to the actions, the attitudes of David's son, Adonijah. Uh, look with me at verses uh, 5 through 10. Uh, actually, 5 through 8. We'll get uh, 9 and 10 in a moment. 5 through 8. Uh, verse 5, then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, one of David's many wives that he had, 
he exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And it's interesting, the writer of uh, 1 Kings here puts this little uh, sidebar, this paragraph, and says, his father had not rebuked him at any time by saying, why have you done so? He was also very good looking, and his mother had borne him after Absalom. So he is Absalom's full brother, uh, had not been uh, uh, corrected by David. And so let's move on, verse 7. When Adonijah conferred with Joab, who was the son of Jeriah, uh, again, the commander of David's army, and with Abiathar, the priest, one of David's high priests, they, Joab and uh, Abiathar, they followed and they helped Adonijah. But Zadok, the priest, Benaniah, the son of Jodiah, Nathan, the prophet, Shimei, Rai, and the mighty men who belonged to David were not with Adonijah. In other words, they did not follow in the revolt of Adonijah. What a contrast we see here, actually. King David, the strong, this mighty warrior, a guy that was virile and masculine in his youth, admired by all the women. You remember when we read through the first and second Psalm, or Samuel, they, they talk about the fact that the women just adored him. They sang songs for him. Now he's bedridden. He's weak. He's impotent. He's at the very end of his days. And up comes his own son, and his own son begins forcing his way into the scene. He himself, handsome, he's popular, and he's never been corrected by his father. Now he rises up to push his father off the throne while his father is still alive. He begins to gather a following, not because he's God's choice for the position, but because he exalted himself, saying, I will be king. This made total sense in man's logic. I mean, not because David had chosen him to be the successor, but because he was just simply the next in line. But don't forget, what, what we see very quickly, there's absolutely no humility in Adonijah's life at all. He exalted himself so greatly that he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him so that as he went through the city and through the air, look at me, how great I am. I've got all these horses, these chariots, these 50 men running in front of me and really, really drawing all the attention to himself about how great and how mighty he was. I find it pretty interesting that it was his own father, David, that wrote the words that we read in Psalm 18, where David writes, speaking to the Lord, for you, O Lord, you will save the humble people, but you'll bring down haughty or proud looks. Those are the very same words that Jesus taught when Jesus speaks to us in Luke 14, that whosoever exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. But apparently David never taught these words to his sons. He wrote them down, and we have them today for our benefit. But we look at his sons, whether it be Amnon or Absalom or now Adonijah, and it wasn't part of their mindset at all. In fact, they were just the opposite. They were all about themselves. In the midst of being a man of war, apparently David was pretty much an absentee father. What a danger that is. I don't care how busy you are, men. You have a responsibility to pour the things of God into your children and even into your grandchildren. As if Adonijah having chariots and horsemen and 50 men running in front of him wasn't enough, he started gathering around him those actually from his own father's court, those that had been very loyal to David, uh, again, to come in and, and come around him so that he could advance his own cause. First one we see is Joab, Joab the commander of David's army, and then Abiathar the, the priest. Both of these men had been with David from the very beginning. Both of them had been loyal supporters of David and his reign, but now their allegiance is turning. Perhaps it was because they saw that David's life and David's power was, was coming to a soon end and there was going to be a void in leadership. And so they started trying to position themselves in the right place. 
They saw how that vacuum of leadership was already present, but still, following man's logic and wisdom, guys, we need to understand that is such a dangerous, dangerous thing. God is more than able to raise up a man of his choosing, even in the most difficult of situations. You need to understand there is never, ever a void in the plan and the purposes of God. We simply need to wait on the Lord, trust wholly and fully in him in our lives. Joab, the commander of David's army. It's hard to understand this guy's motives. Uh, but we can look back at the actions of Joab, and we can't help but wonder, did Joab all along have some kind of ulterior motives? Uh, or did he simply just get disillusioned with David when uh, decisions that David made he didn't agree with? Or was he concerned because David was no longer the leader that he once was? It was back in 2 Samuel where we find that it was Joab that actually had murdered the former commander of Saul's army. And that was after David had made peace with him. And then again, it was Joab that launched the attack that killed Absalom, the son of David, even though David had told everyone, don't harm my son Absalom, even during the revolt. And then later, after the death of Absalom, it was Joab that killed a man by the name of Amasa. Amasa was the commander of, jo of uh, Absalom's uh, army during the revolt. And again, he, he did it literally in, in cold blood. He walks up to the guy like he's greeting him. He had a nice long beard like, uh, uh, like uh, Matt Lindbergh's beard. And he just, it says that he grabbed him with his right hand. And then with his left hand, he, he took the sword and uh, sliced him up. And the guy lost his life at that. So guys, be careful on how long your beards get. And uh, <laughs> Joab had already shown himself to be a man that couldn't be trusted. But then there was Abiathar, the high priest. There was, uh, uh, he had a long connection with David. Uh, he had been priest during David's kingdom, but he too turned against David in the king's old age. And whenever I read of these two that had been so close and had turned so violently against David, I'm reminded actually of the words of David in Psalm 55. Keep your place in 1 Kings, uh, go to the right and uh, find uh, uh, Psalm 55, Psalm 55. Psalm 55, and we're going to begin down in verse 12. Psalm 55, verse 12, David writes, For it's not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man, my equal, my companion, and my acquaintance. And then verse 14 in particular, we took sweet counsel together, and we walked to the house of God in the throng. He said, we had even worshipped together, and now you're coming against me. And I think of Abiathar and how he turned against David. Down, down in verse 21, there in Psalm 55, or yeah, Psalm 55, David writes, the words of his mouth were smoother than butter but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, and yet they were drawn swords. So we have here David's own son, we have the commander of his army, we have a loyal high priest, all of them turning against him. And in trying to fill that void by using man's logic, they actually turned against the will and the purposes of God. All because they had been wooed and, 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 and drawn by the logic and by the schemes of man, by the pride and the arrogance of Adonijah. Ah, but God. There were still many, though, that did not follow after Adonijah. Men who remained loyal to David. We read their names earlier. Men like Zadok the priest, uh, who had actually served together with Abiathar, there was two high priests during this time, both of them serving together uh, during David's reign. Maybe it was jealousy and, and a desire to be the only high priest that uh, caused Abiathar to desert David and follow after Adonijah. We don't know, but Zadok, the other priest, 
he remained faithful. He remained serving under both David and then later under Solomon. Benaniah, the, the, the son of Jehoiada, stayed with David. And uh, he, even though he wasn't the commander of David's army, he served faithfully as one of David's uh, choice bodyguards and over the group called the uh, uh, Carathites and the Pelathites. Again, those that were in kind of the, 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 the bodyguards of David, the, the, the royal uh, uh, troops that were close to him. All because of... Uh, uh, his faithfulness to David, he stayed with David during this time. A little bit later when Solomon becomes king, Solomon raises him up to be literally the commander over all of the armies. And then, of course, there's Nathan the prophet that had been through David through a tremendous amount of things, including the issue with Bathsheba. What can we say about this guy? He was bold, he was honest, and he had this lasting loyalty uh, uh, to David, even though he saw the weakest points in David's life. A prophet of God who was willing to put his own life on the line to continually declare the truth and faithfully cover and protect the king. And we can't forget these others that are listed here. Shimei, Rai, and the mighty men who belonged to God. These were the closest ones. These were the mighty men of God. These were the ones that had joined David back when he was running away from Saul and when David was hiding in the caves of Adullam. Uh, the word tells us in 1 Samuel that surrounding or coming to David were men who were in great distress. Everyone who was in debt, everyone uh, who was disconnected or discontented gathered to David, and he became captain over them. Those are the ones that became David's mighty men. Those guys are still with David. So we see the pride of man. We see the desire for power and fame. We see a lack of humility, a uh, lack of a heart of service, particularly in the lives of some of these leaders. The focus on man's misplaced logic, uh, man's uh, unsound reasoning, all of that coming rather than seeking after the will of God, and all of that always, always, guys, whether it be for a nation or whether it be for a church or whether it be for individuals, that will always be a recipe for disaster and destruction. Unfortunately, we do see the same thing going on right now in our nation. And, and I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. We see way too much that's moving on man's logic and man's understanding. And left to itself, it will tear our nation apart. We need to be praying for our nation, praying for those that are, again, in places of responsibility. Let's get back to 1 Kings, verse 9. Adonijah, he sacrificed sheep and oxen and fattened cattle by the stone of Zaholeth which is by in Rogle. Uh, he also invited all of his brothers. He invited the king's sons and all the men of Judah, the king's servants. Oh, but he did not invite Nathan, the prophet, or Benaniah, uh, the high priest, or the mighty man. No, Benaniah, the, the commander over the mighty man, or Solomon, his brother. He would invited all of his brothers there except Solomon. He wanted them all to see that he was going to be the one who was going to be the king. And my guess is, is that he probably uh, spoke about it in a serious enough threat that uh, for their own well-being, none of these guys pushed against it at all. It's interesting, too, to note that this is actually the first mention of Solomon since his birth was mentioned back in 2 Samuel. But here he is now. But it's interesting, even back in 2 Samuel, we get a hint of what's going to take place in Solomon's life. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24, David comforted Bathsheba. This is after the child that they had conceived out of wedlock died. Then David took Bathsheba to himself, and it says that he comforted her and went into her and lay with her, and so that she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. And then the writer says, now the Lord, Jehovah, loved him, loved Solomon. doesn't say that about any of the other sons of David. Verse 25, he sent a word by the hand of Nathan, the prophet, the Lord did, so that he, Nathan, called his name, called Solomon, Jedidiah, Jedidiah, because of the Lord. And Jedidiah means 
be loved by the Lord. Now, do you think that maybe all these other sons of David knew about that second name of Solomon? Do you think that maybe through the course of time they had heard about the situation with Bathsheba and they also saw that special relationship that Solomon had with David? I think Adonijah knew. I think he understood that he needed to jump into action. He needed to do it very quickly because of David's situation. And so the sides have been drawn up. Nathan, the prophet, realized something had to be done quickly before the nation entered into this great civil war that would have torn it apart. And so he came up with a plan. Now, you need to understand, this wasn't a plan of deceit. He's not deceiving in any way. But it was a plan of timing, putting the pieces together to make as much of an impact on David as possible. Uh, what needed to happen quickly is, number one, he needed to make certain that Bathsheba knew what was going on. Secondly, that she understood the gravity of the situation. Thirdly, he needed to let David know what was going on. Fourthly, that David knew the gravity of the situation. And then fifthly, he needed to put in motion the crowning of Solomon the king as quickly as possible. And all of that had to be done with great care because of what was already happening with Adonijah. They were already celebrating him. Look down in verse 11. So Nathan the prophet spoke to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggath, has become king, and David, our Lord, does not know it? Come, please, let me give you advice that you may save your own life and the life of your son, Solomon. Go immediately to, the king, to king David and say to him, Did you not, my lord, O king, swear to your maidservant, saying, Assuredly, your son Solomon shall reign after me, and he will sit on my throne? Why then is Adonijah become king? And then while, while you're still talking there with the king, I also will come in after you and confirm your words. Now he had rehearsed the scene with Bathsheba and the plan was put in motion. But we're going to find pretty quickly that apparently Bathsheba understood the gravity of the situation very well because uh, as she begins speaking to David, she actually begins ad-libbing, not just what Nathan had told her to say, but she kind of adds to this thing. Again, still in truth of what's going on, but again, she makes it very clear. Look at verse 15. Bathsheba went into the chamber to the king now the king was very old, and Abishag the Shunammite was serving the king. And uh, uh, let's see, I just lost my place, excuse me. Uh, Abishag uh, was serving the king at that point in time. And Bathsheba, in verse 16, and Bathsheba bowed and did homage to the king. Then the king says, what is your wish? Now, the irony of all of this, I think, at this point in time, the woman who had been actually the focus of David's passion, of David's lust, of David's desire, so powerfully that he committed adultery and then committed uh, murder, now she comes in and she finds him in the shape that he's in, being ministered to by a woman who is in all of her youth and in all of her beauty. But Bathsheba maintains her composure, and she maintains the focus of the purpose for the visit. Verse 17. Then she, Bathsheba, said to him, My Lord, you swore by the Lord Jehovah your God to your maidservant, saying, Assuredly, Solomon your son shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. So now look. Adonijah has become king, and now, my Lord, you know nothing about it. He has sacrificed oxen and fatted cattle and sheep in abundance. Oh, and he's invited all of the sons of the king, even Abiathar, the priest, and, by the way, Joab, the commander of the army. But Solomon, your servant, he is not invited. Oh, and as for you, my Lord, O King, the eyes of all Israel are on you, that you should tell them who will sit on the throne of my Lord, the King, after him. 
Otherwise, it will happen when my Lord the King rests with his fathers that I and my son Solomon will be counted as offenders. That word in the Hebrew, offenders, same as uh, sinners. In the, con- in the context, it's the idea and thought that they would lose their lives. The punishment for their lives is that they would lose their lives. Not only is Bathsheba composed, but she's pretty well lays it on the line for David. David, you made a promise that you've never re- uh, fulfilled. Uh, Adonijah, your other son, is actually setting himself up as king, and you don't even know what's going on. And they're already in the process. They've got sacrifices going on, and even all of your other sons are over there with him. Oh, and by the way, your formally loyal high priest and that loyal commander of your armies, they've left you, and they're following after Adonijah in his revolt. The kingdom is waiting for you to act, David. And by the way, my life and the life of your son Solomon are on the line. Well, if that wasn't enough, just about the time that she finishes, the word says that while she was talking with the king, Nathan the prophet also comes in. Look down at verse 23. And so they told the king, saying, Here is Nathan the prophet. And when he came in before the king, he bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My Lord, O king, have you said that Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? For he has gone down today and has sacrificed oxen and fattened cattle and sheep in abundance. Oh, and he's invited all the king's sons and the commanders of the army and Abiathar, the priest. And and look, they're all eating and drinking before him. And they're saying, long live King Adonijah. Oh, but by the way, he's not invited me me, your servant, nor Zadok the priest, nor Benaniah the son of Jehada, nor, the, uh, nor your servant Solomon. Has, has this thing been done by my lord the king? And you've not told your servant who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? And again, the irony of this statement here of Nathan can't be missed. He's actually acting like he's dumber than a box of rocks. And he says... <laughs> It, it, did I miss something in the memo? Did your email to me go in my spam box? How, how, how is all this happening, King? Maybe Abishag, the young maiden, couldn't raise David's blood pressure. But this situation certainly did. Apparently when Nathan the prophet had come in, they had ushered Bathsheba off to an anteroom, a little room to the side or out in the hallway. Uh, But she was close anyway, but she wasn't in the room at this time because verse 28 tells us, Then King David answered and said, Call Bathsheba to me. So she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king took an oath. I I believe what's happening at this point in time, David, who was so weak and so feeble at that point, I think he's kind of gained a little bit of strength at this point in time. He's probably propped himself up in the bed at this point in time. And the king took an oath, verse 29 tells us, As the Lord Jehovah lives, who has redeemed my life from every distress, Just as I swore to you by the Lord Jehovah, God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place. So I certainly will do this day. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth and paid homage to the king and said, Let my Lord King David live forever. I believe that probably when she bowed down, she probably had the biggest grin on her face she had ever seen. Okay, this, this thing is coming together. It's all going to be okay. David, though, didn't stop at this point in time. He still had strength in him. So he continued to call the shots at this point in time. Verse 32. And King David said, Call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaniah the son of Jehoiada. So they came before the king. And the king also said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord and have Solomon my son ride on my own mule and take him down to Gihon or the Gihon Springs. 
And there let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel and blow the horn and say, long live King Solomon. Then you shall come up after him and he shall come and sit on my throne and he shall be king in my place. For I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and Judah. In verse 36, Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, answered the king. Now, this is, this is the army guy. This is a soldier guy. Suddenly, he gets a little uh, uh, excited here. He says, amen. In other words, his, his old boss, his commander-in-chief, has finally risen back up, and he sees that, that fire again, I think, in David's eyes. He says, amen. May the Lord Jehovah, God of my Lord, the king, say so too. And as the Lord has been with my Lord the King, even so may he be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord King David. In verse 38, and so Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaniah the son of Jehoiada, the Cherethites and the Pelethites, all of them went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and took him to Gihon. There Zadok the priest took a horn of oil from the tabernacle and anointed Solomon. And they blew the horn and all the people said, long live King David, or it's King Solomon, sorry, long live King Solomon. And all the people went up after him, and the people played the flutes, and they rejoiced with great joy, so that the earth seemed to split with their sound. There was excitement once again in Israel. You have the high priest, the prophet of God, the leader of the military strength of Israel. You have the palace guards all surrounding Solomon, and Let's look at one more verse, or at least the first part of that verse. Verse 41. Now Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it as they finished eating. Stop right there. They're over here, just a couple of miles away. Adonijah's the king. Hey, that's great. Let's have a barbecue. And they're all enjoying their fellowship and they're eating. And suddenly in the distance... They hear this great uproar. Not just the celebration they had. No, this is so much that the sound seemed like it was splitting the earth. It was so powerful that was going on. We'll get into the rest of that next week. (laughs) But I want to leave you with this this morning, even as the worship team comes up. There's an Adonijah that's waiting for each one of us. When there is a void in our heart that's not being filled by the power and the presence of Jesus Christ, beloved, understand in Adonijah, there's going to be something that's going to fill that heart. The the, the saying is... uh, uh, stated that it was Augustine that, uh, or credited to Augustine or uh, Augustine, the early church father, that there is a God-shaped heart or a God-shaped hole in the heart of every man. And beloved, only Christ can fill that hole completely. Oh, we can fill it with all kinds of things. We can fill it with the desires of our flesh, the the directions of the world. We can fill it with anything and everything, but it's not going to be complete. It's not going to be totally what it needs to be in our lives until it is filled with Christ. That Adonijah is looking to fill your life if you're not purposefully pursuing the things of Christ in your life. You and I as believers, we cannot coast. That's not allowed. Because the enemy looks for the times that we coast. And he will come in and he'll fill it. We need to be those who are actively pursuing the presence of Christ in our life. The glory and the plan and the purposes of God in our life. Not just living our lives by human logic and what comes next. No, we need to be those that say, Lord, here am I your servant. What do you have for me today? Open up your word. Speak to me through your word. 
Speak to me through times of fellowship with other believers. Speak to me through, again, the teaching, the preaching of your word. Speak to me through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, here I am. I'm waiting. I'm desiring. And I guarantee you, when you come to the Lord with that heart, with that attitude, he will fill that void. He will fill it to overflowing, pressed down and overflowing. And he will then begin to be able to work in your life, in our lives together. A miraculous thing. A powerful thing. A thing that is going to be so dynamic that it will shake the world that we live in. When the church truly becomes the church and not just a social club, we will make a difference for our lives, for our families, for our community, and even, should the Lord allow it, man, to change the world. The Lord is coming soon. We can't coast till he arrives. We need to be actively pursuing him. My hope, my prayer, is that that's also your desire. I'm going to ask that you stand with me. We have some that are prayer partners that are with us this morning. They're going to be up here and over here and a couple in the back. As we sing this closing song of worship and praise. Take the opportunity this morning. Perhaps you don't know Christ. Perhaps you, you have no idea of how your sin is forgiven. These would be able to pray with you this morning. These would be able to help you to understand those things and to be able to pray with you. As those come and uh, take their place this morning, as we continue to worship, would you pray with me? Father, I ask this morning that you would do the work that only you can do. Lord, that you would encourage and strengthen our hearts, that you would fill the void of every life, overflowing with your power and your presence. Baptize us fresh and new in your spirit. Equip us, empower us, and gift us for your glory and for the glory of Christ our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching and listening to the current series. We're glad that the Lord is blessing you with his teaching. As you continue on in the teaching of the Word of God in your life, we pray that the Holy Spirit might take that Word, plant it deep within your heart and life, that you might see the fruit of God's love, the reality of His presence, and the power of His Spirit working in your life.